Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Roger. I'm going to be your host for today. I want to start by welcoming everyone who's here in person and viewing online. I'm excited to see everyone here today. Before we get right into worship, I need everyone to go ahead and grab their programs and rip out the response form. Once you've done that, please put down your contact information and any prayer requests that you may have. Once you're done with that, please hold on to those until the end of the service. Once the service is over, you're going to be turning those in at the giving box located in the back of the room. Next, if you're a newcomer, welcome to our church. We're excited to have you. We have a gift for you. Our gift to you is a Victory Coffee Tumbler. The way that you get one of these is by turning in your response form and picking one up at the resource table, which is also located in the back of the room. And now, let's all rise to our feet, get ready to sing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Good morning. morning. Beautiful day. I want to share with you or talk about a word that we're all pretty familiar with. And that word is salvation. And salvation, look at the definition, communicates the thought of deliverance, safety, preservation, soundness, restoration, and healing. But in the Bible, the major use is to indicate a work of God on behalf of men, which includes, and it's a whole more than the definition, it includes redemption, reconciliation, conviction, repentance, faith, regeneration, forgiveness, justification, adoption, sanctification, preservation, and glorification. Salvation is described as the work of God rescuing man from his lost state. Salvation also describes the state of man who has been saved and who renewed and made a partaker of God of in the inheritance of God. According to scripture, the term salvation encompasses the total work of God by which he seeks to rescue man from ruin, doom, death, and the power of sin. His grace also encompasses internal life, provisions for an abundant life right now, and eternal glory. But the key to excellence life is to be centered on God's principles. We're not in control. God is in control. When we think we are in control or want to be in control, that's when we allow ourselves to become arrogant, self-centered, and self-justified. Yeah, we're in control of our actions, but not the consequences of our actions. Many times we try to justify our actions by making excuses, blaming others instead of yourself. That's our human nature, the natural man. It's not God. We can make our own choices because God has given us a free will. But our free will actions may have consequences that we may regret and may have to suffer over. The damage is done and you can't take it back. But the good news is that our salvation through Christ allow God to give us a plan for our life. A specific custom fitted plan for our life Each plan is different. Your plan is different than mine. The key again to succeed in God's plan is obedience. Stick to his plan, not yours, not what you want, but his plan. In Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And the Bible also says in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven to heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Amen. So let's continue as we sing, Salvation Belongs to Our God.
Go ahead and take your seats. Good morning. My name is Dave Lanto. I'm the pastor here at Victory. And as we, as we get um, going into this season of communion right now, I just want to set us up for that. I want to read you a scripture. This is from the book of John, chapter 15, and verse 5. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, early in the book of Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created a beautiful place called the Garden of what? Eden. The Garden of Eden. And it was a place where humanity dwelt with God in uninterrupted fellowship, communing with God, walking with God. And there was nothing that separated humanity from the Lord. But sin interrupted the bounty of Eden. And throughout the Bible, we find imagery that reminds us of the Garden of Eden. The tabernacle was decorated with grapes and vines and gold to remind the people of God of the glory of Eden. The temple was ornately decorated with even more imagery of abundance and natural beauty to evoke images of the Garden of Eden. God wants for His people to remember this special place because the garden, where is the seat of humanity's origins, was the place where we had uninterrupted fellowship with God, without sin becoming a barrier to us and God. And sin is a barrier to every relationship that we have ever since it entered into the world. And so here in John chapter 15, Jesus again turns to the vine as a reminder of the abundance of the Garden of Eden when Jesus said, he's, he's the vine and we are the branches. He wants us to remember Eden. He wants us to remember that abundance can flow through us as we abide in Christ. And so in communion, we take the bread and we take the cup as reminders. Jesus said, do this as often as you will as a reminder of his death. We need to remember his death because we constantly remember that in Jesus' death came abundant life. The same kind of abundance that was in Eden comes through the blood of Jesus. And so Jesus chose the cup of the vine to remind us of his blood, the abundance that comes from Eden. So the bread is an image of partaking in Christ's body that was broken, bruised, and sacrificed. The cup is the fruit of the vine, which reminds us of his precious blood. But first, it reminds us of Eden. So as you partake in communion this morning, I want to invite you to remember the abundance that comes from Christ the abundance that came from his death so that we might have life. And as you come, the elements of communion are right here in the center table. You can come as you, as you are ready and you can go back to your seat, take communion with someone you're with or invite someone to take communion with you or if you want to take it alone. Find a quiet place where you can take communion together and remember Christ's death and sacrifice is, is how we receive eternal life. And so the abundance of Eden is in Christ's sacrifice. So God bless you as you come. Lord, I pray that you be with us as we receive the cup and receive the bread. May we remember your sacrifice and your death until you come again. Until you come again. And we anticipate your coming whenever that will be. May we be your church that's ready to receive you in Christ's name. In our church, we practice open communion. That means if you're a follower of Christ, even if you're not part of this church, if you're already a follower of Christ, come 
and take communion with us. And um, if, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, it's okay to stay in your seat. And, and just make sure on your response card that Roger told you about, make sure you check on there for more information about becoming a Christian and we can help you take that step. So God bless you as you come and receive communion. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. So, you know, recently I heard the story of a woman named Jessie Lee Ward. She was talking about her journey, her life. She had recently learned that she had stage four cancer. This was earlier this year. She had stage four colon cancer. And she was told by the doctors that she would be dead by Christmas of 2023. And when she received that news, she had no clue. She had zero clue that she was sick. And um, this is a woman who's one of the top marketers on the planet. She's a serial entrepreneur with multiple seven-figure businesses. And she, when she learned that she was about to die in months, that put everything in perspective. And she, she decided to chronicle her journey. 
and she was going to fight cancer, and she decided to chronicle her journey. And so she said she was going to chronicle it so that others could hopefully be inspired however her journey ends, that others could, could drum up the will to, to fight. So if you, if you go to her Instagram, it's I am Boss Lee. I am Boss Lee. Her name is Jessie Lee Ward. She talks about Boss Lee as being this persona about her that drives her to achieve, that that's the part of her that she's like, she's going to go at everything she's doing with all that she's got. And so it's always a fight. And it's never just let it, things happen. It's always make things happen. And so I heard her on, on the Ed Milet podcast recently talk about her journey. And one of the things she said in that interview, she's talking about the interviewer asked her, what, how are you looking at life differently now than you were in January of this year when you didn't know you had cancer? And her, her answer was profound because she, she definitely said that it really makes you see things differently. And as she spoke, you, 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 you really have this sense of, of that there was this sharp clarity and wisdom about life that, that she had. And she said this, when you're about to die, it makes you see more clearly. And she was asked about what's important to you now. And she said, well, if it won't matter in five years, it doesn't deserve five minutes of my time. And I thought, wow, what a profound thing to say. And so I tell that story to, to get us started on this message. In our final message, in our study in the book of 2 Peter, the, throughout the summer, We've, we've been studying 2 Peter, and, and yesterday was the first day of fall, and so along with that, it's our last day in this study, and we begin a new study next week. And so this message is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, and the message is called, Goals of the Christian Life. Goals of the Christian Life. And what I want to be able to do in this message is both conclude our study of 2 Peter and point out what, what, what Peter points out in this passage that he kind of summarizes in his book, in this, in this letter, his second epistle. Here's the things that are most important for Christians to do, Peter says. And we're going to look at those three things in this message. And all three are from the mouth of God through his servant, Peter. And if you will make these three goals your aim, then you'll live a happy, satisfying, and productive life. And you'll be aligned with the Lord as well. So I want to give you these three that Peter points out in this passage. And so I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. If you'll join me in prayer as I begin this message, our God and our Father, I do thank you for your word. Jesus, I thank you that you came and that we worship you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our hearts and our presence here this day. I ask, Lord, that you be with us during this time as we unpackage the Word of God, and I pray that you would use these words over these few minutes we have together to speak into our lives, to speak life into our ways, and Lord, that we might better align ourselves with your ways, your truth, your goodness, and who you are, and who we are as your children and followers of Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to begin by, by reading a portion. This first portion, I'm going to give you the, the first goal. The first goal that Peter gives us is to live 
in this way. If, if, if you want to remember things, you've heard me say this before, the best way for you to remember is write it down. Write it down. The act of writing it down will help you remember. Even if you throw away those notes afterwards, the act of writing it down will help you remember. That's how God made your brain. So use that brain hack to help you take something that's powerful from this message today. So live in this way. Make every effort to live a godly life. Peter calls us to make every effort to live a godly life. I'm going to read from verses 11 through 14. It says this, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Verse 14, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting For these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So uh, in in this first section, I just want to unpackage it a little bit for you. when, When Peter started off and he says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved. So he says, since what we've already talked about is going to happen and Peter's been talking about it, we've talked about it over the last few weeks, that there's a day coming when there's a new heaven and a new earth. All things will be remade because all things are corrupted by sin. And so all things will be remade, a new heavens and a new earth, and the return of Christ will happen. And we, 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 last week, David talked about how, how when in, return, in, in the return of Christ, when, when we look at Christ's return and we say, well, what's taking him so long? And, and David kind of gave us this perspective on time. And if you didn't see the message, please go back and watch the replay because David brought some powerful stuff in that message about time and about perspective on Christ's return and, and how God injected the Trinity even into time and space itself. Well, so... Peter says, since all these things are about to happen, since the earth and creation and everything is going to be dissolved, he asks the question, what sort of lives should we live in light of that day coming? So Peter asks, he turns the discussion to the lifestyle of Christians. These things are about to be dissolved, the earth, the atmosphere, space, the universe, and, and it goes on about that in verse 12. And he goes, since the, all of that's going to happen, and he, and, he, and he gives us this proposition that he's about to make. Here's the proposition. We're asked, you know, what sort of people should we be? And that's the best question that we could ask of ourselves. And Peter's asking it for us. In light of the return of Jesus, prophecy, in light of prophecy that's about to happen at Whatever day that God chooses, it could be tomorrow or today, or it could be a hundred years from now. I don't know. It's in God's hands. Only He knows. And um, there's speculation. I hear people speculating that it, the, the return of Jesus could be sooner because of these signs we see in the world. And, and I still say, that's not in our hands. It's in God's hands. So, so we, we know that the Scripture calls us to live as if it's going to happen today but then keep perspective as if it's going to happen in a distant future so that you keep going and keep building your life and keep living your future, keep seeing um, yourself achieve and build and go. And, And so this question, though, what sort of people ought you to be? It's a helpful question because it's, it draws us to consider the quality of the life that we should have. What quality of life should we have in light of the return of Jesus? 
And when Jesus comes back, what will we be doing? When Jesus comes back, what will we be doing? If, if Jesus comes back in a moment, what will you be doing at that moment? And at that moment, will you be like, well, yeah, Lord, look what I was doing. I'm in line with your will. Or, or man, the last thing you want to be doing is like, man, when the Lord returned and you're like, I got caught doing the wrong thing. And, and so it, this, it, Peter's question draws us to, to, to think about how we're going to live. And the implication is that the way we live matters. Do you believe that? Yeah. The way we live matters. Amen. Reach over, tell someone, the way we live matters. Find somebody to tell right now. Yes, it matters to God, and it matters to us. So let's make our lives count. Let's unpackage this message. Christians have two reasons for a real need to align ourselves, our lives, with what matters most to God. We have two important reasons. First is that the return of Jesus is an external motivator to be, as Peter says, be in lives of holiness and godliness. Isn't it interesting how Peter stated that? That your life, that you would be in a life of godliness and holiness. I want to be in a life of godliness and holiness. And, 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 and so um, why is that important? Because Christians will not, we don't want to be in the coming punishment that's to come for those who are outside of God's will, for those who are outside of God's protection, for those who are unyielded to God, like they're, they're, they're going to be viewed at in a different way than those who are aligned with God. And the punishment is for those who are not aligned with God, as Peter tells us here. And, and so those who reject God will be subject to the punishment of God at His return. And there's a widespread thinking among Christians that as long as you say a prayer to accept Christ as Lord, you're all good. You got it covered. And somehow, churches have, have, have misrepresented the gospel and misrepresented life with God in such a way that people actually think that because they said a prayer at one time in their life, then for the rest of their lives, they can just live however they want, and it doesn't matter to God. But it does matter to God. And what Peter is saying here is that because Christ is coming, you who are already Christians... Make sure that you live a life of godliness and holiness. And if you don't live a life of godliness and holiness, you will be subject to the judgment that is to come. And so Christianity isn't the kind of thing that you like, it's not like a barcode, you know, like when you go to a store and, and you, you buy your groceries, you're like, beep, okay, bought it, beep. Bought it, beep, next thing. And you buy all your groceries, everything gets beeped, right? Well, we treat Christianity like barcode Christianity. Beep, I said the prayer, I'm all in, I'm all good. That's not how it is, guys. You gotta live the life. We've gotta live the life. And that's why we gather as a church to help each other live the life. That's why we have fellowship groups, so we come together as God's people regularly, to, to sharpen each other, encourage each other, strengthen each other, to pastor each other, to care for our souls. And that's an important part, that we need to live the life. So the, Peter's telling us the return of Christ is an external motivator to be in lives of holiness and godliness. As a father is disappointed with the bad behavior of their children... So is the heavenly father disappointed with the bad behavior of his children. As a father must teach his children to be good, so must the father teach us to be good. 
And as a father is sad to see his children experience the consequences of their bad behavior, so is the father sad to see us experience the consequences of our bad behavior. Following Christ is not a pass from the consequences of your bad behavior. I have learned that. Has anyone else learned that lesson? Yeah, a few of us have learned that lesson. <laughs> Following Christ does not keep you from experiencing the consequences of bad decisions. The Lord is sad to see us go through it, but because He loves us and because we love Him, He will use those circumstances to help us be at our best. Now, the second reason to align your lives with God ways is that you want to pour your life into things that will last beyond the coming judgment. There are those things that matter and those things that don't. Remember what I told you about Jesse Lee Ward, that she learned that lesson. Some things don't matter that I used to think did matter but they don't deserve my time because my time is so short. And in the scriptures, as we move on, it's interesting because in verse 12, Peter says that we are waiting for the hastening, or waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. We are God's people. We're waiting for and hastening. The, the coming of the day of God. Hastening is the same word, like haste, the same word where speed originates, going fast. So Peter, the language here suggests that believers can hasten or speed up the fulfillment of God's purposes, that is, God's goals, including Christ's return, by living holy, and godly lives. So you have an impact on when Christ comes, amazingly. And um, I, I, I always remember when I think of Christ coming back, when I first, as a little boy, when I, when, when I used to hear messages from scriptures about the coming of the Lord, and, and, and then I would hear the preacher preach it like of the impending coming of the Lord, that it could come any time. And as a little boy, I remember thinking, I don't want Jesus to come back. I want to live. I want to grow up. I remember my, my grandma, Felicitas Garcia, she used to be part of this church many years ago. And she used to say, she used to say, oh, I'm ready for Jesus to come back. She was speaking her broken English. Oh, I'm so ready for Jesus to come back. And I remember sitting on grandma's couch visiting with her, and I was like, not me. And I once said to my grandma, I'm like, Grandma, you had 10 kids. You have like 50 grandchildren. I was a teenager at that time, and I was like, Grandma, I'm not even out of high school yet. I want to get out of high school, and I want to get married, and I want to have kids. I want to grow up. And she said, but the coming of Jesus isn't a bad thing. Like, you're thinking of it like a bad thing. I'm like, yeah, I am, because it seems like the end, right? It's the end. But the Bible teaches that it is the end of one thing that's the new beginning of another that we'll be part of as children of God. And the unknown, Franklin Roosevelt was right. The fear of the unknown is what we what we're afraid of. We're afraid of what we don't understand. And I was, as a little boy, afraid of what I didn't understand. I still want to live. I still have some goals that I want to I achieve while, I'm, while I've got blood flowing through my veins. I'm about to be 54 years old in about a week. And, and um, it's okay. No gifts are necessary. It's all right. So, but like, I still have goals I want to achieve. But I'm okay if Jesus comes back now. I think I can make some goals in eternity. You know? I think I can make some goals in eternity. 
But there, there's some things to do on the other side of eternity. There'll be plenty for us to do. So on this side of eternity, by aligning ourselves with the purposes of God, we can hasten the coming of the Lord. Do you know that David covered this last week, that the Lord's hesitation, the main reason why he hesitates, and I'm going to cover that again today, we're about, that I want to go into there as, as we kind of move on, is, is you move into this next section to that the, the second goal of the Christian life. The first is to live a godly life. The second is, is we're going to, as in, the, in this next section, is, is to win over these people. And that is to make every effort to win the lost. Make every effort to win the lost. In verse 15 and 16, I'm going to read those. It said, Peter says this, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, verse 16, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. That is, some things in the Scriptures that are hard to understand. Which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Well, in verse 15, Peter starts there and he says, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Why does he say that? The patience of God for the return of Jesus, the, the waiting. It's, it's not like God's going like, okay, I got to just like get everything just right before I come back. He's waiting because he's actually inviting us to hasten the day of his coming by winning others to the Lord. It says, count the patience of the Lord as salvation. His waiting is salvation for those who do not know. The waiting of God is so that those who do not follow Jesus may have the opportunity by us preaching the gospel to people in our lives, by us telling the story of God's goodness, by us inviting people into life with God. There are so many people that I know that are not in God's story, and so many people that you know that I don't know, and my people you don't know that are not in God's story, but they need Jesus. And His patience is so that you and me May go and win these people over. Win their trust so that they might find faith in Jesus. And those who are living without the benefit of access to the Creator and without knowledge of His ways, you and me, we have both. We have access to the Creator and knowledge of His ways. And so we're blessed. Amen. We're blessed. And, and so, um, but there are many who don't have those two blessings that you and I have. And so we want to help them have access to the Creator and knowledge of His ways. It'll only happen by us opening our mouths. It'll only happen by us speaking truth, God's truth. And you're very likely the one who is the best bridge to Jesus for someone in your life. You are very likely the best bridge to Jesus for someone in your life. You don't have to be a scholar or some kind of biblical genius. You just have to be you. Just be you and share your life with others. Walk alongside them in their troubles. Walk alongside people. Walk with them when they're crying. Be there to celebrate with them. Your life will witness to the greatness of God as you're just there with them in their lives. And I kind of think that 
Well, your, your life will be the witness to, to his greatness in every way that it can be. Like God wants to use you. And that's an honor and a privilege that God wants to use you to link someone to life with God. And um, as, as you, your life, as, as you walk with people and care with them, like the compassion that you have for people will mean something and build relationships. You have relationships with people who would never go to church. Some of you do. I know not all of you do. There's a statistic that says the longer that we follow Jesus, the less people that we know in our lives who aren't Christians. We sort of align ourselves with people who are like us, and, and, and which is it's just natural. It kind of happens. But with intentionality, I think it, 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 it behooves us. It's a good thing for us to build relationships with people who would never step foot in church. Some of you have those relationships, but you don't want to get preachy, and you don't want them to not like you, and you don't want for this, and you're afraid of that. It's time to stop being afraid. Get over yourself. Get over your fear. Honor God. Go with God. Preach the gospel. Live the life. Invite people to Christ. Tell people the good news that life with God is available and accessible to anyone who wants it. And that, you know what? Here's the thing. I forget who was it that said it. It was, um, I think it was Jordan Peterson who said it. He said it on his podcast. He said that I'm of the opinion that there really aren't any atheists in the world. There are no atheists. There are just people who don't know what God they serve. I know people who, who say that they mock religion, they mock my Christianity, they mock faith, they mock Jesus. And, and, but I look at their lives and I'm like, atheism is their religion. It's just another religion. Atheism is religion which is an irony because they say that they don't believe in God, but they've made their belief in no God their religion. It's just another religion. That's all it is. And just as you would help someone unpackage any false belief, so atheism, you help people unpackage their false belief with truth, with rationality. And, um, oh my goodness, there, it, th this isn't even like, this isn't even a thing to to show how atheism is a fallacy. It's simple. It's, it's very simple. And it's not even a hard thing to do if people will listen. The hard thing is that people won't listen. They're too stuck in their ways. And they just want to affirm what they believe. And so that's why Christians do that too, where we just get around people who believe like us and think like us. But you know what? We're better for being around people who don't think like us. We're better for being around people who don't believe like us and having conversations and going at it and shaping those, our, our, our own perspectives and, and our own ways of, of being by interacting with people who believe differently. So for our part, I just want to say that you're the light of the world. Go out and shine with the gospel. And... Um, let's join God in being patient toward the ungodly so that they might find salvation in Christ. And they might, that those precious souls that we know and love, their family members, their friends, their people we work with, their neighbors, that we just need to take some risks and have different conversations. But I would also say this. I've seen too many Christians that I think we do it the wrong way, and we just go, hey, you know, I used to have this friend that I was his, his mentor and in, while he was in grad school, and he was, in, he was in, uh, going to seminary, studying to bring, be a preacher, and I was his mentor, and his way of doing this was he would go into the city and on the street corners and just start preaching the gospel with, a, with a, you know, one of those things, a megaphone. And he would just preach the gospel on the streets. You've seen him. You've seen people do that. And I don't know about you, but I, I've never done that. I've been with people who are doing it, and I'm like, man, I feel really like odd doing this. It's not my thing. It's not my thing. But, but 
his way of doing that, and, and, then, and then he after he graduated, you know what he did? He raised support, and he got in, a, in, a, in an RV, and he took his wife and his family across the country, and they would preach the gospel like in major cities all across the United States. He did it for like three years, and that, he was driven to do that, and I don't fault him. I'm like, okay, rock on, go do it, but I think that most of the time when you enter into the conversation without having a person's trust, it, it, it's almost like they're de- you're falling on deaf ears. Most people don't listen. There's a few that are ready for it, and they respond to it. There's a few. But most people just look at it, and they're like, no time for that. I don't have five minutes for that. <laughs> I don't have five minutes for that. And they actually think, like, okay, picture what I'm saying here. You know what you know. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that the gospel message is the most important message in the world that people need to hear, right? So think about that. We've got people preaching on the corner, and people go, I don't have five minutes for that. They don't have five minutes for the most important thing in the world. They don't realize it. Well, why? Because they would, they would take five minutes for it if they had the trust or if, if, if the person who was speaking had their trust. You know what I'm saying? And, and so the lesson for us is how do we earn people's trust? How do we earn people's trust? So I recently got a call from a young man. Call me up. We hadn't talked for a while. He's like, man, he texts me first. He's like, hey, I've been wanting to, wanting to talk with you. And I'm like, every time I get that kind of talk, text or, or something, I'm like, okay, it's something bad. There's a problem that they want me to, to my help with or something like every single time when somebody says that to me, that's just how I think. I'm like, okay, okay, all right, yeah, call me whenever you're ready. And so when we talk, it was just this week, and he called me, and, and you know what? He, what, what? It was an unexpected call, and what he had to say blew my mind because he said, Dave, I've recently rediscovered the faith that I knew as a little boy when, when I used to go to church with my grandfather. And I was like, for real? How? He goes, I just been thinking and, and, and like just I've, I've been thinking about God and I just want to follow God. I want to get my life aligned with God. And I go, wow. And I, and I go, Where'd you, why'd you call me? And he was a guy who used to, who, he used to work for me as, as a 1099 employee just when I needed someone. That was our experience, professional relationship. And he goes, I know our, we have a mutual friend. And, and he goes, he told me that you're, you're, you know, I know you're a pastor and you told me a little bit about that. And so I'm, that's why I'm calling you. And so he's calling me to ask for my advice and talk about faith. And, you know, like, wow, what an unexpected call. This guy's like 26 years old. He calls me. He's like, I go, is there anybody in your life who you would call? He goes, no, I don't know any other Christians. Wow. And I want to follow Christ. And blown away. Very cool. So we start a conversation. And, you know, I think that the way we live plants seeds for moments like that to happen. But if we don't live the way that plants the seeds, then those moments won't happen. You follow me? Like, you're planting seeds of the goodness, of the gospel, of you know one of the greatest tools that Christians have to win over lost people is hospitality. Mm. Hospitality. To invite them to share a meal with you. I, I don't know about you, but I find that I eat every day. Anybody else? Anybody else? Do you eat every day? Some of you guys eat every day? What about the rest of you guys? What are you guys doing? How are you... So eating, I eat every day. So like I make a goal where I'm like, okay, every week I'm going to have a meal, share a meal with somebody who's not a Christian. Every week. Every week. Share a meal with somebody who's not a Christian. And that's a goal that I have for myself. It pops up in my, in my Google you know, tasks to do this week. <laughs> Get it done, Dave. Find somebody who's not a Christian. Why? Because I want to win them over to Christ. 
I won't reject them if they don't, but I'll befriend them along the way. And so hospitality, having them into your house, taking them out for a meal, bringing a meal to share, I find all three of them work. All three of them, choose one. I brought lunch, I got extra lunch, you want to come and have lunch with me? Let's meet here. We can meet at the park. And the reason why hospitality around a meal is powerful is because, is because you have conversations. You have conversations. You start talking about life. You start talking about what's important. And you get opportunities to get into their life and speak into their life. If you have a house, invite people to your table. I used to think about the table as an important place. I still do, but I, I used to think about like the imagery of the table as the most important place in the world. So we, in our house in San Francisco, we used to have this huge table, and we got it used, and Marcia found it. You know, how Mar who knows that Marcia is always on the hunt for used stuff and finding great deals and fixing it up, making it look beautiful. So we had this table. Remember that table, David? This table... It was, it was a table that was a, a, a banquet table, and um, it would normally easily sit eight people around it, but you could open it up, and then it sits another six people around it, something like that. And so we, this table was all beat up, the veneer was messed up, and so you know, we work with wood, and so I took the kids, and I'm going, okay, kids, this is our... our um, table, we're going to refinish our table together. And so, the, you know, I, there's, there's pictures of like Jillian refinishing the wood and working on it. And, and so we made this table look beautiful. And, you know, the kids, they're all little kids when, at that time. They're all adults now, my kids. But they were, when they were little kids, we did this. And that table, literally hundreds of people sat around that table over the years for us to open our home and fill that table up. Sometimes it was just a few people. Sometimes it, we invited the whole neighborhood over. Sometimes it's intentional people. But like we would always invite people over for that table to be filled and have deep conversations about life. And that season marked forever for me that the table is the most important place on the planet. Because table is where you make connections and barriers are knocked down and, and you share the gospel. So um, you can make a difference by being hospitable. Learn to, if you're not a hospitable person, I would encourage you, if there's one Christian practice that you say, I'm going to make that, make it my point to become good at that this year, it's hospitality. The hospitality has always marked the people of God since the Old Testament into the New Testament, that we welcome people in, we invite strangers in, we invite people into our places, we serve them food, and we have rich conversations, and we celebrate around our table. And so I invite you to be people who take on this perspective. Now, the last thing, the last goal that Peter gives us here is that grow toward this end. Make effort to grow spiritually. Make effort to grow spiritually. Grow toward this end. In verse 17, it says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. At the start of your ventures in life, be sure that you know the end result you're striving for. At the start of anything you do, make sure you know what you're aiming for. What's your goal? What is your goal? And how are you going to get there? Goals are to help you get there. If you don't have goals, you probably won't achieve anything. You need to set goals for yourself. Every person needs to set goals for themselves. I remember the day that I learned the importance of goals. It was at the start of our business. And, and early on, when, when we think about, you know, every business needs two things. It, don't, it doesn't matter what business it is. 
It doesn't matter what business it is. Whether you're selling a service or selling a product, you need customers and you need something to sell. Every business has that in common, those two things. You need customers and you need something to sell. You're in insurance business, you need customers, you need something to sell. You're in the dental business, you need customers, you need something to sell. You're in the grocery business, you need customers, you need something to sell. Everything. Every business requires it. So in our business, we sold the service of refinishing wood. And, and so we would refinish any kind of wood. Furniture, um, cabinets, floors, windows, doors, trim. And so we would refinish all these different types of, of, of wood. And um, I realized that man, we, we're putting all this money out there for marketing and, and, and we're getting all these leads in, but our sales aren't hitting our targets. What's going on here? Why aren't we selling enough? We need to sell more. You're like, well, you, you have to reverse engineer it. So what's your end result? And how many, how many jobs does it take? You know, how much monthly business does it take to get there? You know, if you, if you go, this is how much you want to make a year. Divided by the, by the month and how many uh, customers that, that you have to sell with your average job and figuring all of those metrics out. We, we, we went down to, we, we'd figure out every single metric, how many leads that we need to take in on a daily basis and how many of those leads we need to convert into estimates and how many of those estimates we need to convert into sales and how many of those sales we need to do every week, every day, every week, every month, every year. And then we started hitting our goals. We started hitting our targets. We started making money because we had goals and we were like, oh, we're falling short of our goal. Falling short of our goal, we got to change something so that we hit our goal. That's true of your personal life too. But we find that people don't, most people don't make goals. And even of the people who set goals, very few of them actually write down their goals anywhere. And there's a thing that, the, the, uh, I'll say this, that the biggest needle mover from childhood to adulthood in life is one thing. The biggest needle mover. You know what I mean by a needle mover, right? Like, you know, the, the, the needle's moving in the right direction, you know, that kind of a thing. What, the, there's one thing that is the biggest needle mover from childhood into adulthood. Just one thing. And I can, like, I can like talk to anybody and I can tell where they are with this one thing and I'd be like, this is an adult who lit is still a child. I don't care how old they are. If they don't have this one thing, they can be an adult and still be a child. And there's plenty of adults that are children. Here's the one thing. Do you want to know what the one thing is? You want to know? Anybody want to know? I need to see hands if you want to know. All right. All right. It's this. If you want to, if, if it's that they take complete responsibility for their lives, 100% complete responsibility for their lives. You, you, if you want to take charge of your life, then stop justifying your bad actions, refuse to rationalize and make excuses, rise above other people's opinions, and realize that no one else is responsible except for you. That's it. When people take complete responsibility for their lives, they've entered adulthood. That's it. So when, when someone can be, if someone were 13 years old and they take complete responsibility for their lives, that's truly entering adulthood. If someone is 40 years old and they haven't, they're still in childhood. And, and sometimes you get, this happens with guys a lot, like if they marry the right woman, the guy can still be a child, but the woman is not. So it's masked. You don't see it. You know, the, the, because the woman's, you know, taking responsibility. And, and, it, and, it, and, it, and like a lot of marriages fall apart because of things like this. Because a man won't take responsibility. He wants to act like a child. And his wife is taking responsibility. And he's not even giving her credit for it. He's taking credit for it. And, and, and that's, a, that's a brutal thing that will destroy marriages. But... The, the, I've found that the single greatest mover of the needle is taking responsibility for your life. So Peter tells us that it's, it's interesting because in verse 17, he, say, he uses this word, this thing about stability. He said this, I'm going to just read this part again where he goes, he goes, don't lose your own stability 
like the others who don't follow God. And he goes like, take care so that you're not carried away with error, the errors of lawless people and that you would lose your own stability. I love that Peter, Peter did that. Your stability depends on you taking responsibility for your life, 100%. And so growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord calls for us to build habits into our lives that will cultivate Christ-likeness. I call it the victorious Christian life. The victorious Christian life. And um, I wrote this, and I, I put it on our website, on Victory's website. I'm going to read it to you. And I call it the victorious Christian life manifesto. And it's right on our website. You can see it yourself anytime you go to our, our website. All right, so here we go. The Victorious Christian Life. Sheesh, it's there. We got a lot of pages on our website, but it's there. All right, here we go. There we go. It's there. There, I found it. Okay. Victorious Christian Manifesto. A victorious Christian is a new breed of human, living proof of God's transforming power. A victorious Christian believes in the power of God to overcome every addiction, compulsion, and means of shame. A victorious Christian builds the endurance to withstand the hardest of times. Struggles from within and without will not keep them from their mission. A victorious Christian blesses big, trusts freely, and journeys together. They won't allow doubt to sidetrack them. A victorious Christian sees life as a trust, ministry as a calling, and discipleship as a mission. A victorious, victorious Christians are no longer bound, but are free to live and love like Jesus. Victorious Christians are on a mission to empower the powerless. I am a victorious Christian, and life of, a life of victory begins with God. So, remember I told you earlier about Jesse Lee Ward? who found out earlier this year, I am Boss Lee, that she, was, she has this cancer, and they gave her, you know, you're going to be dead by Christmas. And, and, and when, they, when they told her that, they said, if you get on a, an aggressive chemotherapy program, we can prolong your life for two and a half years and then you'll die. She started asking, okay, what would my life be like with chemotherapy? And, and, and so started talking about it, and, and really, she, in her conclusion, like the quality of her life was a zero-quality life. A zero-quality life. And so the doctor said, you can either get on chemotherapy, and we can prolong your life for two and a half years, or with no quality of life, or you're going to be dead by Christmas. She heard in her thinking that second option was the or was not just you're going to do nothing. It was I'm going to fight every way I can to overcome cancer. And that's what she took on. She took on her boss Lee persona for, for fighting cancer. And she changed her life, this high in these injections of vitamin C and all this stuff, and on and on it goes. And she's on the Ed My Life podcast about a month ago, a month, last month. And um, she died about a week and a half ago. She died. She died. They're right. She didn't make it to Christmas. She died. And that podcast that she was on, she kept speaking after that, even on her own Instagram, millions of followers. And as, as she, there, there's a lot of content that is yet to be released from her speaking to the world about this journey. But in nothing that she said, I haven't heard her say, she said, getting chemo and having no quality of life wasn't an option for me because that wasn't really living. And, and she was careful to say, like, that's what I decided for me. And I'm not recommending that for anybody else. But that was me. And she went down that path. And she tried to fight it every way she could naturally. And it didn't work. It didn't work. And 
Um, is, is that mean that it's a failure? Does that mean that it, it's like, okay, she should have taken chemo? I don't know, maybe. But, you know, either way, she wasn't grasping at life as in just trying to endure. She was grasping at life to live every day, to make a full day out of this moment. And as God's people, in this message where I gave you these three goals, <coughs> you know, I'll, I'll close by saying there are four reasons why people don't set goals for themselves. <laughs> four. There's only four. Everybody who doesn't set goals, it's one of these four, or maybe all of them together. But one of them is they don't think goals are important. People who don't think goals are important rarely achieve anything great. Second, they don't know how to set goals. Fair. But don't let that be an excuse. Go learn. Third, they have a fear of failure. What if I fail to achieve my goal? You might. You probably will. But you'll do better than if you had not set any goal. You'll make more progress than if you had did, not, did not set any goal. And the fourth is that they have fear of rejection. Oh, this is a terrible one. What has fear of rejection stopped you from doing in your life? What has fear of rejection cost you in your life? If you could calculate what it costs you, your fears and your inaction, what would be the quantitative value? Because I guarantee you it's somewhere. There's a quantitative value, and we'll never know that. But, I, but I, I'll, I'll tell you how you could find that out. You're a child of God. When you get to heaven someday, you can go, God, I'm going to ask you a question, and I think I'm going to regret asking this, but can you tell me what my fear and inaction cost me in life? And if God told you, how do you think you would feel in that moment to receive all that? knowing what you could have been, what you could have done, and you didn't. God's people, let's not let that be the story of our lives. Let's make a decision today to be different people. Let's wake up. Let's do something different. Let's be something different. Let's make goals for ourselves. Let's achieve. Let's go farther than anybody ever envisioned we could go. People will tell you, you can't do that. And you say, yes, I can, or I'm going to die trying. I'm going to die trying. You know, Jesse Lee Ward died fighting against cancer naturally and having a good quality of life every day from the day she found out till the day she died. That was what she set out to do, and she did it. Will you join me in prayer? Our God and our Father, we love you and we praise you. I thank you for who you are and what you do. Lord, I just believe that you want more for us than what our lives are right now. You see more for our future than we see. You believe bigger in us than we believe in ourselves. And Lord, this is a day where as a church... We can make the choice to align our thinking with your thinking. Believe big. Act strong. Be courageous in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would use us as people who will make a difference in this world by making goals, setting ourselves to these particular goals that are outlined in 2 Peter. I pray God... And we would not let any fear or make any excuse hold us back from who we're truly meant to be in Christ's powerful name. If there's anyone here that you need to do business with God, just as the band sings, you're going to rise to your feet in a minute and sing, but as they sing, do business with God in your quietness of your heart. Do business with God in the quietness of your heart. Speak those words that you need to speak to God. Allow God to, 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 to like invigorate your soul, to bring your dreams to life. 
and that you would be a person who, who is obedient to Christ in every way that you can be. And the first step to life with God is to align yourselves with God's ways. And that begins with giving your life to Jesus. And so I encourage you to put your faith and trust in Him by God's power. Will you rise with us right now as we sing?
It's been good to be together today, church. If anyone has put their faith in Jesus today, congratulations and welcome to the faith. Please send us the email to info at victoryanaheim.org. We want to hear from you and help you take your next steps in following Jesus. Next, here at Victory, we practice the tithe, which is 10% back to God. God bless you as you give. For today's announcement, fellowship groups have started back up. Make sure you go back to the resource table, check out the fellowship groups that we have to offer, read all the details, find out the dates and times, and find out who the leader is going to be. I encourage everyone here to sign up for a group if you're not a part of one. It's a great thing to do amongst um, each other. You grow strong in the faith, and you become closer with the people that you already know or may not know. So let's go throughout our day. Let's have a blessed day, and let's sing one last time.